<laughs> Good. Nice to meet you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Mike Fitzgibbon. I'm a branch manager in the research division. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and we're here today to discuss California's strategy for meeting its greenhouse gas reduction targets, uh, specifically for fluorinated gases. So before we be begin the workshop, I, I have a few uh, safety and housekeeping announcements. Uh, please look around now and identify two exits closest to you. In some cases, an exit may be behind you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate this room so please take your valuables with you and do not use the elevators. Uh, while staff will endeavor to assist you to the nearest exit, you should also know that you may find an exit door by following the ceiling mounted exit signs. Evacuees will exit down the stairways and possibly to a relocation site across the street. If you cannot use stairs, you will be directed to a protective vestibule inside a stairway. And should we have to re relocate out of the building, please ob obey all traffic signals and exercise caution while crossing the street. And so the restrooms and drinking fountains are to the left. Um, a reminder to please silence your cell phones. Um, and so today's agenda, we're gonna have a maybe 30, 40 minute A or B pre presentation and then we're gonna open it up to discussion and during the presentation, um, webcast viewers can submit their questions to the address listed up there. It's sierrarm at arb.ca.gov. And then after the webcast, uh, please submit your questions to the link that's listed on, on the slide there. So I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. Shannon Dilley, attorney with the California Air Resources Board. Hi, this is Pamela Gupta from Research Division Air Resources Board. Glenn Gallagher from the Research Division of Air Resources Board. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn. That'll work. Okay, well thank you everybody for coming here today and all the webcast viewers who have tuned in. Uh, we're here to talk about, of course, uh, the California Air Resources Board proposed regulations and rulemaking on Reducing Hydrofluorocarbon HFC Emissions. And the reason we're doing so is for many reasons. It's uh, why regulate, first the outline, why regulate HFCs to begin with? How will California meet our Senate Bill 1383 emission reduction targets? That is a Senate bill that requires California to reduce HFC emissions 40% below 2013 levels by the year 2030. So to put that into a little more context, it's essentially reducing HFC emissions 60% below business as usual and about to half of what we're emitting right now. So right now, the HFC emissions in California are about 20 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents per year. The goal is to reduce it to less than 10. We'll talk about the global HFC phase down of the Montreal Protocol, also known as the Kigali Amendment. And we conducted an emissions reductions analysis on what that phase down in production and supply would mean for emissions in California. 
We'll talk a little bit about the federal SNAP program, significant new alternatives policy as the ozone depleting substance management program of the US EPA and the current litigation. And a brief description of rulemaking one for California adoption of US EPA SNAP provisions to limit high global warming potential HFCs. Part two of the presentation will be on the SLCP strategy or short-lived climate pollutant strategy, which is part of that Senate Bill 1383. It includes reduction in HFCs, also black carbon from soot or smoke and methane. And then there will be plenty of time for, for comments and questions afterwards. I think this will go best if I just go ahead, give the presentation and you can save questions and comments and we'll have quite a bit of time. Well, in the first place, why regulate HFCs? They're very potent short-lived climate pollutants with very, very high greenhouse gas potentials, global warming potentials. Uh, they're the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases in California and also in the world. Just one pound of a refrigerant such as 404A or 507 being released to the atmosphere is the equivalent of driving a vehicle more than 4,000 miles. So we're talking about very powerful greenhouse gases. There are many international HSE phase-down efforts underway. The Kigali Amendment is global. It will phase down HSE's production and consumption. European F-gas regulation has been in force for some time now, and they have very aggressive goals of cutting their F-gas emissions by two-thirds, less than 2014 levels by 2030. Canada has adopted the equivalent of the US EPA SNAP requirements. And Australia is also implementing a domestic phase down beginning in January next year. Reducing HSE emissions is one of the six main strategies of California to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, along with renewable energy, a cut in petroleum, uh, safeguard California's adaptation, actually, carbon sequestration, energy efficiency, and reducing short-lived climate pollutants is a big part of the plan of Senate Bill 32 requires 40% reduction of all greenhouse gases by 2030, so HFCs being a part of those. Well, before we can try to manage or reduce HFCs, we need to know how many are being emitted. CARB estimates HFC emissions in California. We use the uh, standard protocol of looking at emissions at the equipment end of life, annual leak rates, and then we figure in the new equipment fleet each year and the different kinds of refrigerant they use. We have adapted the US EPA vintaging model to California by using California-specific data that we receive each year from the refrigerant management program reported to us on refrigerant usage. We funded eight different research studies. We look at many technical reports. Uh, this is all written in a paper I wrote in 2014, Environmental Science and Technology. And we, we track the HFC emissions um, actually pretty well. So we know that they've been increasing each year. That's no surprise to anybody. These emissions come mostly from stationary refrigeration. You'll see in the pie chart on the right-hand side. The HFC sectors, 2013 being our baseline year. Stationary air conditioning is another big part. Mobile air conditioning and transport, a little bit less, followed by propellants, insulating foam, solvents, and fire suppressants. But today we'll be talking about stationary air conditioning and refrigeration refrigerants. How will California achieve these required reductions? So if you look at that bar chart, it shows in 2030, if there were no additional measures from today forward, there'd be about 27 million metric tons of emissions. And we need to get down to less than 10, 9.9. .9. So after a very thorough analysis, we assess that the Kigali phase down would get us at least about a quarter of the way to the reductions we need. The US EPA SNAP rules 20 and 21, another quarter of the reductions required, and the other half will have to make up. Most of that would come from 
AC and refrigeration regulations on the stationary part. The other 5%, it could be incentives for early adoption of low GWP. It could be heavy duty motor vehicle air conditioning. So a valid question might be, why don't we rely on the global phase down only? Um, after all, it's uh, been signed. It hasn't been ratified by the US Senate. We did an analysis on the impact, and we looked at the phase down schedule. Starting 2019, 10% less production and consumption, and eventually stabilizing at 85% less by 2036. So that looks pretty good for production and consumption. But there is always a lag time between the supply and the emissions because once you put a refrigerant into the equipment, that equipment tends to use it and slowly leak it out over the next 10 to 15 years. We, we modeled four different phase down scenarios. We looked at the phase down schedule I just showed you and we used the historical emissions from CFCs and HCFCs after they were phased out or phased down. And the thinking is that that's a very good real world example of what happens. It's in very complex circumstances of you have reduced supply and some people will um, get away from it soon and some people will keep using CFCs and HCFCs for a long time. We applied that to HFCs. This is bounded by a best case scenario where there's low GWP adoption quickly and a worst case scenario where new equipment and servicing uses the highest GWP still available under the phase down. So this methodology is actually under its second round of review and it was reviewed by experts from Anthesis Consulting Group, formerly Caleb, Palm, Kimors, DuPont, ICF International, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, United Nations, US EPA. And with that, I can summarize a 36,000 word analysis in just 20 years, uh, 20 words. California cannot meet its HSC reduction goals by relying only on the global phase down. Additional HSC reduction measures are needed. One of those measures will be California adoption of the US EPA SNAP provisions in Rule 20 and Rule 21 as part of the SNAP program. And of course, the SNAP program lists acceptable and unacceptable ODS, ozone depleting substance, and their replacements. Background, most of you know, or all of you know that currently Rule 20 of SNAP is under litigation in Mexichem Floor versus US EPA. Uh, the initial ruling was that Rule 20 was vacated. The next rule, which prohibits high GWP HFCs, is also at risk. There was a strong dissenting opinion on the definition of replacement and a request for appeal. It's important for CARB to act because it will provide regulatory certainty, protect the emissions reductions that were already written into law, and if the final court decision does uphold all of Rule 20, CARB would essentially drop this rulemaking and we would just again rely on federal SNAP regulations so we wouldn't have a parallel rule. And now we'll, now we'll look at potential reductions that the US EPA SNAP measures 20 and 21 would achieve uh, for California. That's about a quarter of the reductions we need. Here's a look at just the SNAP sectors covered, the um, end use sectors covered by SNAP. And you'll see it's dominated on the right by retail food and on the left by light duty MVAC, that's motor vehicle air conditioning. With also the, the rules cover cold storage, chillers, insulating foam, residential refrigerator freezers, and vending machines being a very small part. What's not shown is aerosol propellants because CARB essentially has the same requirements that SNAP came up with. So we were about a few years ahead of them. So we're proposing that we concentrate first on the stationary refrigeration and air conditioning. We could cover the MVAC through the clean cars program and insulating foam reductions could be covered through Title 24 building code changes. 
and essentially this is just a list of the initial focus is on the stationary refrigeration and AC systems. Super retail food, essentially, remote condensing, standalone or self-contained, vending machines, food processing, dispensing, cold storage, chillers. Uh, we've kind of purposely left out mo motor vehicle AC, insulating foam, aerosol propellants, and uh, household appliances for now, which we will cover in uh, uh, separate programs. And this is a very busy look at all of the refrigerants that the SNAP Rule 20 covers. They're all high global warming potential HFCs. I won't spend too much time on that. More refrigerants. And Rule 21, pretty much the same list of high global warming potential refrigerants for chillers. How would CARB enforce essentially an adoption of a federal requirement? Well, there's a lot of different approaches that we're considering, and we would really welcome your feedback on what you think might work best or not. It could be as simple as record keeping, reporting, auditing, labeling, um, all four of these, or a combination. So we're still kind of at the early stages of uh, proper enforcement. The comments on the draft regulation of adopting SNAP into California, uh, we would appreciate by November 10th, and at the, uh, the web link you see there. Obviously, comments after this presentation are welcome. We're always open for individual meetings and conference calls with you. And if you're a webcast viewer, you can submit questions and comments too. I think there's a slight difference in the email here. Sierra RM at calepa.ca.gov. You can try both of those emails. Next steps, timeline. The staff report, initial statement of reasons or ISOR, essentially lays out the rationale on what it is that we're doing. Then the, uh, the official 45-day public comment opens. Your early comments would be essentially informal. A board meeting next year, followed by a regulation effective date by mid to late 2018. Okay, part two. There will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. This is the short-lived climate pollutant strategy, SLCP, to reduce HSCs. This should be familiar if you've already seen it. Some of the dates may have changed a little bit from the draft. This is a kind of a reminder. Uh, the ODS, ozone depleting substance refrigerant sales, are down. HFCs are up. If you look on the left, that's R22. Sales are going constantly down, as they should, because it's being phased out. And if you look toward the center, the R407 series, those are all HFCs, and their use is increasing with each year. There's just kind of a trend analysis there. So now we're looking at the, the pink portion of this bar chart. How will we achieve this almost 50% uh, of reductions we need to achieve the Senate Bill 1383 goals? The SLCP measures are in the final that was published March 23rd of this year. It has prohibitions on high global warming potential refrigerants and new equipment, sales restrictions of very high GWP refrigerants, and also we need to clean up a little bit of the um, conflicting language in the existing refrigerant management program, and that may also be a part of it. But those would be minor changes. The proposed measures for stationary refrigeration are in 2021, Refrigerants with a global warming potential of 150 or greater are prohibited in new refrigeration systems containing 50 or more pounds of refrigerant, a system being a circuit. And in the same year, 2021, refrigerants with a global warming potential of 1,500 or greater prohibited in new refrigeration systems containing 20 pounds to 50 pounds of refrigerant, a bit of a gradient there. For stationary air conditioning, same year, refrigerants with a 
GWP of 750 or greater would be prohibited in new air conditioning systems. The threshold um, we're looking at right now is for two pounds or more, and the intent is to not include the, the very small room air conditioners. For chillers, which are generally thought of as air conditioning but can be used for refrigeration, that would have a GWP limit of 150 in 2021. So that's either used for comfort cooling or refrigeration. The sales restrictions, by 2021, we would restrict sales of refrigerants with a GWP greater than 2,500. And by 2024, uh, this threshold would be lowered to 1,500. Okay, but what is the rationale behind this? Why the start date of 2021? This might be a little different than what you've seen before. Well, it's because the technology and the feasibility have finally caught up. Uh, low global warming potential refrigeration is available now. Lower global warming potential air conditioning actually is available, but the codes and standards won't allow its full use in the United States. So it's more of a technical limitation, um, less of a technical limitation than a codes and standards problem. There is a, an added cost at this time, initial added cost of the low GWP equipment, about 10 to 20 percent for stationary refrigeration, 5 to 10 percent for air conditioning as our best estimate. We believe this cost will continue to decrease with each year and it should achieve parity at some point with traditional systems. There are savings on low GWP refrigerants. They, they generally, the natural refrigerants, do cost less per pound than HFCs. Energy efficiency can increase using low or lower GWP refrigerants. Um, I think that's an issue that'll come up quite often. Um, there are plenty of studies to show great energy and efficiency increases, and a few studies that show in extremely hot climates, uh, they do worse. What are some of the challenges on this? Well, the local permitting agencies for stationary refrigeration, they really don't know much about these new low GWP refrigerants, so they need to be educated. For example, even carbon dioxide with its uh, high operating pressures, it kind of makes them nervous. And uh, the same with ammonia, hydrocarbons, and some of the hybrid systems. Air conditioning, we are well aware of the fact that the slightly flammable refrigerants, less than 750 GWP or A2L refrigerants, are not allowed in most air conditioning equipment right now. We're, we're working with the codes and standards committees and we're, we're trying our, our best to accelerate that. We know there's a certain timeline that it requires. There's also a shortage of technicians that have been trained to work with these uh, slightly flammable refrigerants or even the uh, ammonia and CO2. A little bit more on the codes and standards. They have to be updated before they can be used. This is essentially stationary air conditioning we're talking about. There are set timelines. They may be able to be accelerated through intervening code cycles or addendums. For example, there was a, an effort to update the uniform mechanical code that California follows to allow some flammable refrigerants. Uh, that's an ongoing effort. And we are contributing to a very large study on the safety and uh, some of the mitigation that can be done with flammable refrigerants. That's on, ongoing. Well, if California prohibits these high global warming potential refrigerants, which refrigerants can be used? Well, the top three there are the what people call the natural refrigerants. These are all very low GWP. Carbon dioxide is refrigerant, ammonia, hydrocarbons like propane and isobutane, but there's also the latest synthetic refrigerant of hydrofluoroolefins, or HFOs. They have very low GWPs, and they're essentially HFCs that, uh, that are unsaturated, so when they are released in the atmosphere, they break down quickly and have, have no ozone depleting and very low global warming potentials. For air conditioning, it appears that the, the best refrigerant to use at this point are essentially lower GWP, we don't call these low, less than 750, HFC 32 can be used with a GWP of 675. 
And essentially, HSC 32 is already half of 410A, which is a common air conditioning refrigerant. It is slightly flammable. There are many HFO HSC blends being developed. The ones listed, and there are many more, are all less than 750, and they're all slightly flammable. Um, here's just a quick example of some of the groceries, uh, grocery stores in California that are already using low GWP. Albertsons, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Aldi's, um, also Safeway, Rayleigh's, Target, and many others. It's becoming quite common. This bar chart shows the growth of full CO2 stores or transcritical CO2 using all CO2 for refrigeration in California in the blue, USA in the red, and you can see going from just about zero, I guess, in 2013 to last year, of course, the growth is phenomenal. And here is a look at a map of North America. There are more than 560 locations that use CO2 refrigeration. More than 300 of those use transcritical CO2 or all CO2. All CO2. And you notice some of these, uh, the secondary in the yellow and cascade in the blue, those are what we call hybrid systems. They use a little bit of HFC and a lot of CO2 or another heat transfer fluid. And some of these are in very warm climates. Now, internationally, there is definitely a global transition to low GWP refrigerants. European Union kind of leads the way. It's got 9,000 transcritical CO2 stores. And they have very tough um, phase down requirements as well. The technology is improving daily. And we expect it to be at uh, efficiency, energy efficiency parity with uh, HSCs. Um, some people say it already is, and we expect it to definitely be there in a few years. To make it a little bit easier for small businesses to transition to low GWP, we are we are developing a potential incentive opportunities to fund early adopters of low GWP refrigeration or air conditioning through our greenhouse gas reduction fund. There was 20 million that was included in the governor's budget, but it was never quite approved for spending. So we were very, very close. We're going to continue to try uh, to find funding opportunities. In the meantime, the best bet for incentive funding is to work through a local utility. For example, with the um, Sacramento Municipal Utility District here locally, they created a new incentive program, uh, the first of its kind in the country, we think, and it serves as a really good pilot program for, for future funding opportunities. And again, enforcement, uh, same potential enforcement mechanisms, record keeping, reporting, auditing, labeling. Timeline on the uh, SLCP measures or HFC reduction measures. This is a little, uh, a little bit on a slower timeline. We'll continue to have public workshops and meet with you individually um, throughout the rest of this year through next year. The staff report or initial statement of reasons, ISOR, it lays out the um, rationale for the regulation, the cost, the savings, uh, how it would affect small businesses. And it's very comprehensive. That will be done in about a year. And then the official public comment period opens followed by a board meeting. Right now, we're trying to find uh, December 2018 as the right date. And the regulation effective date would go in 2019. So there's plenty of time for feedback and uh, stakeholder meetings. Uh, this is just a little overview of the rulemaking process. There, there are some very specific steps that are required. Stakeholder engagement. Uh, that's, this is part of it. A lot of internal consultation on the economics, the enforcement, small business impacts, environmental justice, um, environmental quality act, and the impact of that. We do a very thorough cost benefit analysis. And that will come out on the ep economic impact assessment form, which will be included in the staff report. The proposed regulation order, which would include the draft regulatory language 
We have that written for the SNAP adoption. We do not have draft regulatory language for the SLCP portion. Followed by public comment, board hearing, changes, final information, digest, statement of reasons, final regulation language, and adoption. And that's essentially all of CARB rulemaking follows these steps. We would really like your feedback and comments on our approach to adopting the SNAP provisions for California and also on the proposed SLCP, short-lived climate pollution measures. Comments can be submitted to the web link shown. And if you're a webcast viewer, you can submit comments through email at sierrarm at calepa.ca.gov. And now I'm going to turn this over to Pamela Gupta, who will moderate questions and comments part of this workshop. And thank you very much. Thanks, Glenn, uh, for the great presentation. So I think it would be helpful since we are talking about two rulemakings here. So the first one, which is the adoption of SNAP provisions and the state regulations, is obviously at the ex more expedited time frame. So if we can get folks to give their feedback uh, or input on the first one, uh, maybe we can sort of organize it better. And actually, since it's a webcast, I think it would be useful to if you can speak on the microphone. So if you can raise your hand, um, somebody will get the microphone to you. Okay, here. And for the folks that are watching it via webcast, so you can send your questions um, to the email that Glenn has on the... Oh, oh the screen is gone. <laughs> Maybe you should show it, yeah. Uh, my name is Peter Williams with the New Era Group. I have one specific question. How do we determine and what is the definition of high global warming refrigerants? Where's the break? Uh, 3,500, is that high? Is 2,500 medium? Is 150 low? W what's the definition? Can we get some clarification on a national basis for that? Well, technically there is no definition a real definition for high GWP. In our refrigerant management program, we say it's anything that's 150 or greater. For very high GWP, what we mean is a refrigerant that has, is in the thousands of global warming potential values. It's not a legal definition at this point. What we use those global warming potential values are is more like guidelines on anything above it is something we don't want emitted in the air, and below it is generally thought to be acceptable. I'm, we're probably going to have to define those in the draft regulations. Like for example, why settle on 2,500 for sales restriction? Essentially what we're doing is we're trying to reinforce what the industries are already moving towards, which is the first phase down in the allocation in 2019 the first thing the, the refrigerant chemical companies will want to stop selling is anything greater than 2,500 to preserve their 10% uh, allocation cut and they can still sell just as many pounds of refrigerant. The 1,500 coming later at 2024, that coincides with the 2024 Kigali phase down of 40% production consumption levels. So what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to promote the trends that are already occurring. Uh, 150 it, it was established essentially by European F-gas regulation to say anything above 150 was high GWP. And that was essentially to allow um, motor vehicle AC to use HFC 152A, which is just under that. That's where that came from. 750 for air conditioning, we also were influenced by the European Union where they realized that R32 is probably a pretty good air conditioning refrigerant, and that happened to be less than 750, but more than 500. It has a GWP of 675. Is it arbitrary? Not necessarily. I, one could uh, probably think of it that way. But what we're doing is we're trying to follow international standards. There's a question on the uh, webcast. I can just take that. So the question is from um, Nanette um, Ingersoll-Rand. 
And she asked, do these proposed HFC regulations impact transport refrigeration? Um, I guess to the extent, so right now with the SNAP provisions, we're so, uh, adopting whatever uh, end users are regulated under SNAP provisions. So our understanding is TRUs or transport refrigeration is not part of those end users. So hence, for the rulemaking one, um, they are not, um, we're not impacting transport refrigeration. And please, we would uh, request your input on this. I mean, if you're missing anything, we would want to get your feedback. Right. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Dick Lord with Carrier. Uh, in regards to the SNAP ruling, um, where you're gonna adopt SNAP provisions, are you gonna be fully harmonized? You know, because for example, every time we wanna use a new refrigerant, we have to go through all the paperwork, submit it to the EPA, get SNAP approval, and if we have to now do it twice, and then the two lists aren't harmonized? Um, good question. Uh, so right now, we're, so you're right, SNAP right now has two pro uh, programs. They approve refrigerants, and then they have the uh, second part, which is disapproving or prohibiting certain um, high GWP HFCs. So our, the state that we are uh, planning to incorporate is the second part, which is prohibiting high GWP HFCs that SNAP prohibits. So we're not taking over the approval part per se. Yeah, my, my question on the, and I appreciate the answer, uh, on the delisting, uh, will you be harmonized with the, with the EPA or will it be a, be a separate California delisting list? So right now, like I said, we are basically incorporating the SNAP rules, US EPA SNAP rules by reference. Yes. So i am got another webcast. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Let's see. So this is from Jeff Warder, um, Dan Foss. There are several different types of chillers. For 10A, school-based chillers are a very big market share. In the smaller 10A chiller range, the GWP value of 150 would completely eliminate this type of design. The chiller value needs to be based on current refrigerant designs. If the OEM has a 410A design chiller, the GWP value should be 750, not 150. We'll make the note of that comment. So this is more of a comment. Um, Corey Mamron with HRI. Um, I guess I, I understand that this, the adoption of the SNAP provision is, is to give certainty to the marketplace and that's, that's appreciated. We have a substitute microphone here. But, but at the same time, uh, the second rulemaking, we basically undo uh, what the SNAP provisions are in a way. Uh, like, for example, the chairs. I mean, the SNAP rule does not uh, limit the GWP to 150. So, so you, you, you want to give certainty to the market for just a couple of years, or I, I, that, that's the, the confusion here? Um, I, we understand. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to adopt what US EPA already, supposedly those regs are already in place, so we're s sort of adopting just the way they are. But the second rulemaking is something we've been talking about through our SLCB, for, and it's critical to meet our targets. So hence, we're sort of putting it out there that this is also coming, so that there's industry is pretty, I know it con sounds confusing, but it's also to give people, put this on the radar that there's more coming. So if people are beginning to change, you know, they can decide how they want to do it. So the first part of rulemaking is basically what federal, you know, already had it, so. Uh, I would probably just add that um, the certainty we're trying to provide is the US EPA rules were already adopted and approved on a national level. And there's, there is no doubt that our CARB rules are um, going to be more stringent for new equipment and sales restrictions. And so I guess you could say that the SNAP rules would work well through 2021, and then the CARB rules in many ways would, would make the SNAP rules um, a little bit unnecessary uh, for some of the new equipment. But uh, that's, we don't see that as a reason not to adopt the SNAP rules. We, we definitely want things to continue. We want to basically preserve the HSC reductions that are already occurring. <laughs> of 
quiet audience. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Derek Hamilton with Sheco. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, first of all, we, we fully support the, the, the adoption of, of the SNAP rules. I think, as we heard, it does provide some certainty to the market, um, especially for companies who are already investing um, in, in bringing products to market that, that can help meet um, the, these new regulations. I think that's really important. Um, and I think what, what was seen as we've been following the, the market in Europe is that you know businesses really do respond to that certainty. And I think that's something we should keep in mind even moving forward into the SLCP rulemaking, that having so, some certainty in, in the regulations, be that um, specific bans on, on specific refrigerants um, or, or using certain um, equipment, I think it's important to have that clarity that, that gives defined timelines and defined targets for the industry to meet. Thanks, Eric. Ed Esper with Rayleigh's. How certain is the 150 long term? Yeah. Oh. Uh, is your is the uh, the sub subtext of your question? Are we going to lower the 150 at some point in the future? How certain is the 150? Well, I mean, right now, 150 is in uh, our refrigerant management program, as defined as, you know, more than that, 150 or greater is high GWP. We have never defined low GWP, believe it or not. Um, that, is, um, that is actually, there's a reason for that, is because we don't also want to get locked in to allowing, uh, for example, 20 years from now, maybe uh, 149 GWP will seem quite high. Um, I don't know what kind of certainty we can offer. Quite a bit for the next 10 years. How's that? That's probably as good as it gets in this business. Yeah, I think Ed, that's a good question. I, there's definitely plenty of low GWP, you know, like I think on the slide we saw 1, 4, 10. So the 150, like Glenn said, is mostly based on what the existing definitions are there. Um, but the, so that's yeah. the, but you know I, I can anticipate that we would not change that any time before 2030. I mean I just find that very unlikely. Hi, I'm Pete Murata with Grocery Outlet. How are you? Um, question for you: How what are you going to do to align the local building departments? with the adoption of natural refrigerants. You know, there's always some confusion there. We're talking about, um, this is not California, but my brother did a system in Manhattan where they did a CO2 system in a high-rise building and the local fire department, everybody flipped out. They wanted purge systems and, you know, exhaust fans and because they don't understand the quantity of the CO2 uh, as a danger, they think it's dangerous. Same thing with ammonia and so forth. Um, the second part of my question, since I have the microphone, is what is Cal EPA going to do to help align utilities such as PG&E that seem to be slow in adopting incentives for sustainable measures? Um, they seem to be really slow on um, guys compared to, say, Edison and uh, San Diego and, and, and uh, SMUD. But PG&E, we have a lot of stores of PG&E area, and there's not a lot of incentives for a lot of the green measures that we want to put in place to help our operators. Thank you. So on your first one, we are aware of that, and that's something we're looking to see. We'll continue to work with, you know, um, uh, the uh, industry, you know, the agencies out there. We are aware of that, and I know um, some of the front runners like Whole Foods has uh, set, you know, broke the ground by working with. So hopefully, more uh, folks coming, trying these. Um, low G will be uh, technology, hopefully uh, we'll get more experience out there, but we're aware of that and something we'll be uh, continuing to look into and we want your feedback and what's the best way to get those uh, aligned, um, or at least people um, informed about that. So more outreach and more discussions. 
Um, I know the North American Sustainability Refrigeration Council, or NASTREC folks, I don't know if they're in the room. I know they're, they're been, um, trying to do some work with, uh, on that issue also. Uh, regarding your second question, um, incentives. Uh, so you're, um, so SMUD actually, as you, we are, so short answer is we are aware of that, and we, that's why we uh, continue to work with the utilities to see if they can use, they have a lot of budget um, that they can use for these incentives. The only limitation is they're currently focused on energy efficiency, and we want them to recognize the value of the um, refrigerant itself also, the GWP. SMUD is the, definitely the first one that has come out. In fact, they, SMUD had a workshop in March um, trying to show uh, at, you know, their program and hopefully other utilities like PG&E. Those folks were there. Um, so if the program is successful, I think they're all looking to what SMUD is doing and maybe they can build on a similar uh, program in their um, jurisdiction. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I can say right now. Uh, Paul Delaney, Southern California Edison Company. In response to the gentleman's comment and your comment about the natural refrigerants group that Ed and others are part of, uh, part of the struggle with the natural refrigerants is being able to compare them to a baseline. And because anything that we incent has to show an energy efficiency in improvement. So that's part of the struggle, especially in supermarkets. That's a, that's a big deal and difficult. Uh, and for the record, uh, Edison, pg and &E in San Diego have always had programs for incenting more efficient natural refrigerants. SMUD just was smarter about their marketing capability and how to make it look better. But we've always done that, and we have a number of installations in Southern California that are, are in place and operating that are using ammonia and CO2 and other things. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. I didn't see you in the room. <laughs> Dick Lord again, I actually have a lot of questions, so I'll give them to you, pace them out over time. But you know, regarding the GWP of 150, um, picking a arbitrary GWP can have negative ramifications. Um, you know, when you look at these refrigerants and you get down to very low GWPs, a lot of them become lower pressure, less dense. So when you start to put it in a real system, that can impact efficiency. Like take a GWP of 150 and put it in a split system, do you really want a four inch suction line running through your house wall? You may end up with things like that. Pressure drop, temperature drop can be significant. It, you know, and we need to keep in mind when we look at these refrigerants, you know, and I'll, I'll cite some numbers, but you can argue about this is 90 to 95% of the emissions come from the efficiency, not from the refrigerant emissions. And if we do a better job with reclaim, recycling, reduction, you know, do we need this? I mean, your, even your own forecast showed a floor level of 299 GWP, worst case, you know, if you do your model. So that's one of the things we're looking at, because, you know, picking an arbitrary low GWP, you can throw out some options that actually might have been a very efficient option. I think, sure, and Glenn, correct me if I'm missing something, but I think that your our point about energy efficiency is the major player. It's true. It depends on the end use, depends on the size. Uh, so yeah, for smaller equipment, that's true. That's correct. You know, there are more energy efficiency plays a bigger role because the refrigerant is a smaller part of the footprint. But then when you go to these giant big systems, we're talking um, even the refrigerant emissions are pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess I'm talking more of the large centralized refrigeration system. Well, um, please, please use the microphone so folks on the webcast can Sorry, hear. and I was going by the chiller where you picked a GWP of 150. Um, that's going to rule out some options. Oh, I and see what you're saying. It's actually, to the comment that the guy gave, it'll basically make no 410A chillers available in this market in 2021. Okay. I, thanks for the clarification for chillers. Um, I am receiving a bunch of webcast questions here, so maybe I should take some of those. Um, so there's a question from, I'm going to see the name of the organization here. So this is, I have the impression on that main focus of SNAP provisions are on stationary refrigerating and HVAC systems. Are there currently plans to include mobile HVAC system installed in railway systems? Well, <laughs> 
The short answer, for, as far as the SNAP is concerned, do you want to take it? Well, um, SNAP does not currently cover transport refrigeration, um, either uh, railway or shipping containers or transport refrigeration units. Um, I can tell you if by railway system, if somebody means a locomotive or train, uh, the emissions from those compared to other sources of HSEs are quite low. Um, it would not be the top of our priority. That doesn't mean we're not going to look into it and cover it. Um, transport refrigeration as a total is actually a very significant part of HSC emissions. But if you're talking about a train or a locomotive, no. Refrigerated shipping containers and transport refrigerated units, yes. A question on mobile AC. So what do you mean by that mobile AC will be addressed separately? This is a question from Nissan USA. I think uh, you're referring to the SNAP provision. So right now we um, left mobile AC provision out just because um, I guess our goal of uh, picking on stationary was more for the ease, for the ease of implementation, given um, that the fact that there's an existing infrastructure. Uh, so for mobile AC, our um, thinking right now, and we want your input on this, is to have it go through the advanced clean cars program at some point. There's already a, a credit mechanism in place for uh, incentivizing low GWP refrigerants in MVAC. Um, but um, as far as the SNAP uh, rulemaking or the provision um, to require uh, low GWPs could be part of the advanced clean cars. But again, that's, that's kind of our, our current thinking um, to address the different pieces through the, uh, so MVAC would be through advanced clean cars, foam insulation is the other one that SNAP included, which we right now are sort of relying on the Title 24, the uh, green building code process. Um, again, our intention was more for the ease of implementation, uh, but there may be, if there's strong reasons we should adopt the entire, everything in the entirety of it, then we want your feedback and comments on it, so. Maybe I already answered that, but the question is, can you speak a bit more about the basis for the determination you mentioned earlier that blowing agents and insulating foam can be covered by Title 24 building code changes? Why is that a more appealing regulatory vehicle than incorporating EPA SNAP requirements for foam by reference as you are proposing for refrigerants? Yes, um, like I said, again, it was more, um, our initial thinking was because we are um, focused on the stationary refrigeration in, my, in our group here and um, at ARB, but the foam insulation is something we were actually working with Title 24 um, before e even SNAP came out. So that's why um, we were, um, we basically went back to Title 24 process. So, um, but we'll consider your comments, so. Uh, okay, so I think we captured that. Hopefully it answers the question. Uh, Tristan Coffin with Whole Foods Market. I just want to tag on to a few of the comments that were already made. Um, I'm also a board member of the NASRC. So to um, tag on to what Paul was, was speaking to, as well as Pete's question, um, we are looking to baseline um, efficiency on natural systems. Uh, so if anyone would like to get involved, please uh, please come and, and talk to me or, or reach out to the NASRC. In terms of um, the code standards and keeping up with natural refrigerants, I just want to tag onto a comment that Pamela made. So uh, you, you all were very supportive in some of the um, systems that we've rolled out today. But what I would say is I think it's important that um, you get it in front of the state fire marshal and other authorities having jurisdiction here in the state of California um, so that they're well aware of this coming down the pipeline um, because that has been fairly challenging, um, especially when you're getting down to the local jurisdictions uh, that at the end of the day will defer to either federal and or state regulation. So I think it's really important that the codes and standards are keeping up with the other regulations that we're talking about today. So thank you all. Thanks, Justin. And we would like to get your input on how best to approach those, yeah. Stephen Mandrakia, Hudson Technologies. Um, just a lot of clarification. In, in the past, um, pretty much all the materials that have been provided by CARB have indicated that uh, future sales bans would not, would exempt reclaimed refrigerants. So 
when you talk about a 2020 ban on GWP products of GWP of 2,500 or more, and the 2024 of GWP of 1,500 or greater, would those exempt sale of reclaimed product? I think right now we say yes. Um, we would, um, for, a sh for a short period of time, we would allow, re obviously, reclaimed refrigerants. That's definitely an option. Um, you know, obviously, we promote recycling, recovery, and reuse of refrigerant. Um, actually, implementing the program might be a little bit tough. So we're looking into it, and it's something we're going to explore. I don't think we're ruling it out or in at this point. Can you add to that? Well, uh, follow up on that. To the extent that there's any decision, consideration of not exempting reclaimed product, that would create a, um, an immediate um, um, uh, uh, issue with regard to the existing um, uh, existing systems in place. There would be no source for aftermarket refrigerant for anything in excess of those, and that would uh, that would create a very strong uh, incentive for product to be um, disposed of in improper manner. Uh, reclaimed refrigerant, um, and one of the things that we think is that the uh, this organization should look to is ways to uh, deal with the aftermarket, because as the as your study indicates, a very high percentage of the emissions come from the aftermarket. And um, incentivizing refrigerant management, re recovery, reuse, and reclamation of refrigerant uh, is, a, is a, I think, a very good way to help achieve the goals that you have and also perhaps accelerate some of the, um, the programs you're looking to do in phasing out by um, allowing um, existing refrigerant that's in place to be continue to be used rather than having new um, uh, molecules manufactured and brought into the, into the aftermarket to be vented and replaced with cheap refrigerant. So um, we've highlighted a number of ideas that we think should be considered by CARB, and uh, we would strongly urge you to uh, exempt any um, reclaimed refrigerant from any sales bans going forward, as the EPA did in 1996 going forward. Um, and we're still seeing R11 and R12, 114 um, refrigerant being used in systems, which maybe in the long term is not what you're looking for, but at the same time, this product has not been vented, has been preserved, and has not been replaced by new molecules, which are causing different issues. So. Um, we strongly urge you to um, consider exempt and continue your statement that um, refrigerant, uh, reclaimed refrigerant should be exempt from the sales bans. A question to go along that I was going to ask it later, but do you track reclaimed refrigerant? That would be very beneficial. I know EPA tracks a little bit, but they aren't retracking at all. And, um, you know, when you look at a lot of the use models, and I'm not sure what's in your model, reclaim refrigerant was a key part of implementation of the phase down. So, you know, encouraging us to reclaim refrigerant, letting us reuse it, you know, meeting ASHRAE 7000, or ASHRAE 7000, you know, would be been 700. That was getting mixed up. So to the extent we actually built on EPA's uh, 608 uh, program where California refrigerant management program actually requires reclaimers to report their the refrigerant reclaim. So I don't know if any of you have facilities in California. You're probably reporting to us. <laughs> if not, then you know. uh, But yeah, so we already, we do require reclaimers to recl uh, report to us. And then even the facility, at the facility level, they're supposed to report to us the refrigerant that's sent to reclaim, uh, for reclam reclamation. So. And there is, uh, based on what we have seen so far, um, there's obviously good recovery and rec reclamation in R22. But as we know, HFCs are... Um, and mostly because of the blends out there. A couple of comments, Pete Williams from New Era Group. First off, I think that we need to be realistic about the reclamation program under uh, the Clean Air Act. Um, in my opinion, it's been become now an abject failure. Um, I have. Um, fought with EPA to disclose the total amount of refrigerant in the United States that has been turned in. Okay, first off, they, that, that number is so small. We pointed out to them during our um, struggle with the uh, allowances on HCFCs to again address the issue of 
you know, reclamation versus how much gas was produced and consumed. We found 1.8 billion pounds of 22 produced in the United States. And to date, we see 9.4 million pounds of 22 reclaimed. Where's the gas going? Again, we look at some issues that are out there. We have several issues out there. The 608 rule is something that's the elephant in the room that's not being discussed today. It's being challenged, okay? We know that the uh, former administration's climate action plan has been, you know, executive order has been filed on that. We come to the point now, we look at all the refrigerants, the SNAP approved refrigerants that are going into systems, don't top, top off a system, don't vent, so forth and so on, are all there. Well, maybe in the state of California, it's good, okay? But on a national basis, 35%, I'm talking to reclaimers all over the United States, 35% of the refrigerant is, is cross-contaminated. In other words, more than one chemical is put together. Consider the, total, to, the totality of taking that gas from a system, taking it back to a reclaimer, putting it through these, these uh, separation columns that typically are two and three times, all the fossil fuels that are being burned, okay, to get it back, when you have a Chinese market, which has taken over the U.S. refrigerant market, a hundred, I provide you proof from ITC, 607% increase in one year, Chinese imports. Why reclaim refrigerant, okay, question, when it's cheaper to buy the Chinese import? One point. Second point on that, in that area is that EPA recognized it is very difficult to, to distinguish the difference between virgin refrigerant and reclaimed. So if you allow a sales restriction to go through on reclaimed refrigerant in California to sustain equipment end of life, how do you know that I on the East Coast am not going to ship you virgin product and call it reclaimed? This goes into your issues of enforcement. I think that you ought to look at those very closely and see what your resources are in that area. Okay. So we have a question from Tammy Helminski, partner at Barnes and Thornburg. Will California proceed with all of Rule One, including both SNAP Rules 20 and 21, if the current DC Circuit Court ruling stands saying EPA cannot regulate HFCs under Section 612 of the Clean Air Act? Um, while I don't agree entirely with the characterization of, um, you know, the ruling, uh, we will be going forward with uh, our rulemaking if it stands. Um, here's a question that came in. Multi-part question. I, I think I'll try to answer it after each question. Can you clarify some points about the sales ban of refrigerants? Is it a complete ban? regardless of whether the high GWP refrigerant would be used for new equipment or existing equipment? And the answer is yes, it would be a complete ban. Would existing equipment that contains high GWP refrigerant have to be retrofit, or could you continue to use that equipment and replace leaks with reclaimed refrigerant? Um, it's a little bit nuanced. If you can legally buy the refrigerant, uh, you can definitely use it as long as possible. In other words, if you had a 404A system and there was a sales ban on 404A, but you had other equipment you owned that had 404A, you could take it out of the old equipment and use it in the new equipment. Um, so we're not banning that. And as long as there's recycled, reclaimed refrigerant uh, essentially on the market, that's, well, that, that's uh, actually one of the nuances. At some point, would you have to retrofit? Yes, if you could not obtain the refrigerant. Uh, of course, with the 2500 ban, there uh, are near drop-in replacements um, right now. Last part of the question. Would you control cross-border imports? Um, for example, what would prevent someone from purchasing refrigerant in Nevada and bringing it into California? That's an excellent question. Uh, it has to do with enforcement. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer. <laughs> well, we are aware of that, and that's something we'll be looking into in, as part of our enforcement approaches. Derek Hamilton with Sheco. Um, 
you know, to go back to the point about um, refrigerant that's manufactured, it ends up in two places. Either it goes to reclaim or it ends up in the atmosphere. Um, and as we know, the, the amount going to reclaim is nowhere near uh, what it should be. Um, what we've seen in other parts of the world is that as you approach a deadline for, for a sales ban, you see a spike in uh, the, the quantities being bought. So people are stockpiling that refrigerant. So I wonder what um, measures you're thinking about to avoid people stockpiling refrigerant, because that's effectively, you know, it's, it's increasing the, the production in the short term, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, I mean, that's a valid point. I think that's happening with R22, as we know. Um, so hopefully the prices um, are going up already. Um, so the market would, for the um, you know, signaling is going down for HFCs. Because I know with uh, 404, I, I'm seeing the, uh, again, we don't have all the information, but based on some indication we got, the 404, uh, the high GWB 404 prices may be going up also just because that's part of the, this whole global phase down is gonna drive some of that too, uh, so. You know, one of the reasons that um, CARB is promoting low or lower global warming potential new equipment is to essentially reduce the demand for those high GWP HSCs in the first place, because we know if they're available, they're going to be used. I mean, stockpiling is definitely an issue. And when CFCs and, and even the R22 were, were banned or phased down, a lot of illegal imports came in and they're still coming in. That's extremely hard to control. Uh, we think almost like instead of trying to solve the problem at, you know, at the so-called end of the pipe pollution, we're, we're, we're really going for a, a pollution prevention approach, which is you, you take away the demand for it and hopefully that will help a lot. But in the meantime, of course, you do have continuing emissions. That's one reason why the phase down, although the Kigali phase down I think will work really well when enacted, it's going to take some time to see results. And I'd, I'd like to actually put it back to you, Derek. Do you have any ideas on how to handle this issue? Uh, uh I could best answer that by looking at what, what's been done in Europe when they've been really putting in a system of um, compulsory training for anyone uh, working on systems with F gases, uh, coupled with um, reporting of any uh, refrigerant that's added to or, or taken away from the system, um, as, as well as um, any refrigerant being purchased. So it's really having trained individuals um, and having a, a clear record of, of when refrigerant's being added and taken away um, I think that's that's the best way to enforce that. Thank you. So I think the direct good news is that for our, with our existing refrigerant management program, we already track that, so, at least for the station refrigeration systems. The question we got on webcast, um, Kevin Washington from ITW. Uh, during the presentation, you cited an intention to adopt EPA Rule 20 as part of managing leakage for self-contained commercial refrigeration. Is CARB also considering adopting the EPA regulation that set new field service requirements for refrigeration service technicians? I think that you might be referring to the Rule 608 here, right? SNAP Rule 20 doesn't talk about the leakage or service technicians. So um, 608, like I was mentioning, so 608 did, uh, was amended recently to include some more requirements for service technicians, and that's something we uh, hope to address by, um, we are planning to amend our state regulation, uh, which is a refrigerant management regulation as well, and it has some requirements for service practices, and um, it already covers HFCs, but um, we will be um, trying to align it with the US EPA 608. Hi, this is uh, Kevin Messner with AHAM. I just wanted to build off of the last comment on the possibilities of end of life with the refrigerant. I think the comments were focused on refrigerant that made sense, but there is a third possibility on foam blowing agents, and that's the bioremediation and landfill process that does. So it's not necessarily reclaim or emission in all cases there is a bioremediation process that can prevent emission. 
But I just wanted to be clear on that. It's another possibility. Thanks. Thank you for that comment, Kevin. It's actually one of the eight uh, CARB-funded research projects I talked about was looking exactly at what happens to waste insulating foam after it's been landfilled. And, and I guess the good news is after it's been landfilled, uh, most of it actually is bioremediated or it's somehow captured by the existing methane capture system and destroyed thermally. So insulating foam is a real problem for HFC emissions while it's being used. It has very slow diffusion and uh, when it's being torn apart. But once you landfill it, it's actually not a problem. I, I think our research finally uh, put that to rest. So we agree bioremediation of a waste foam is a great idea. Um, I'm going to read a question from an email. Will the rulemaking cover process chillers as well? Current activities identified are retail food refrigeration, food dispensing equipment, air conditioning chillers, refrigerated vending machines. Um, our intent on, this, on adopting the SNAP regulations was to adopt exactly what was in SNAP rules 20 and 21 for stationary refrigeration and air conditioning. Uh, I believe the chillers were under the air conditioning portion. I'd have to look to see if it covered process chillers. Um, our intent is to essentially adopt the SNAP regulations. And with the new uh, CARB SLCP rules, it would definitely cover process chillers as well. Okay, so there's a question um, from Brian Gaffney. Because 90% of refrigerant emissions happen at the end of life, effective disposal of those currently in circulation is essential. After being carefully removed and stored, refrigerants can be purified, purified for reuse or transformation into other chemicals that do not cause warming. How will either of the proposed rules discussed today or other CARB measures regulate proper disposal? This is something that we are uh, reviewing, um, and we welcome any suggestions on that. Just to follow on to the question I was sinking in, what you said is these bans like the 750 and the 150 is a total ban including service. That means in three years the product we're selling today we cannot service. And you know a lot of the options are A2L, substituting an A2L into a unit that was designed for A1 I is, think is a risk. I think uh, you're sort of, maybe you're mixing. So when we say ban uh, for the one, the 150 and 750 are the new equipment. That's not the servicing ban. I just want to make sure. Um, a question from an email: Will indirect emissions be considered when making decisions on low GWP? Um, indirect in this case, I assume to mean from electricity usage. The answer is definitely yes. It's actually, we've looked at energy efficiency in everything we've done on HFC measures for many years now. We are aware that there's this tremendous controversy about the energy efficiency of replacement refrigerants. We're very pleased to say, after looking at all the evidence, it's essentially at parity or better with obviously some glaring exceptions. If you have transcritical CO2 in the middle of the desert, it is quite a challenge to make it as energy efficient as HFCs. We are aware of that. Um, however, there's, there's booster systems and there's technology being invented as we speak that will, this will probably not be an issue a year from now. Right now we realize it is an issue. So we're um, looking at the indirect emissions. I can tell you that California has such a low carbon intensity on their electricity compared to some states. The emissions from indirect electricity usage on any given refrigeration system is about 5% of their carbon footprint. 95% is from refrigerant losses. Air conditioning, that tends to be a little bit more energy intensive. 
It can be up to 50% of their greenhouse gas emissions are from electricity, but it's generally no more than that. Uh, it's hard to believe because I've, I've been hearing a lot. We all know 95% of the carbon footprints from electricity. That's essentially only true of something like a room air conditioner that will never leak. There's also true uh, household refrigerator, about 70% of the footprint is electricity, 30%. When we're talking refrigeration systems or big AC, it's, it's refrigerant. Um, and I'll include all this in the staff report. Uh, it's pretty eye-opening once you run the numbers. Uh, next part of the question. For example, there was one recent study that showed that total warming impact would be lower if a 300 GWP refrigerant were allowed instead of 150. By limiting the 150, you lose some energy efficiency benefits. I would just say, you know, if, if we are aware, I'm not aware of this study, if there is a refrigerant out there with 300 GWP with incredible energy efficiency, we want to know about it. Uh, we would definitely consider allowing that. Can remember with the HRI. I, would, I wanted to follow up with the Dick's question about the, the sales restriction on refrigerants. Uh, you have a sales restriction of 1500, for example, and um, that will eliminate 410A in 2024. So, uh, how, how, how are we going to be able to service 410A after 2024? Uh, unless, of course, we have reclaimed refrigerant, which I'm assuming then you're going to be allowing reclaimed refrigerant. <laughs> well, that's that's the part that we have to look into, yeah. I mean, so that's why we need your feedback. I have a question from my guest, uh, Alan Arkema from Arkema. Could you clarify is Carl planning to adopt the SNAP dates for foam? Well, the current proposal that the draft regulation we have out there is for the stationary refrigeration air conditioning. Um, so that's the one we're adopting by reference. Um, insulating foam, like I said, is something we are trying to go through the Title 24 building code process. Um, I can't remember the dates for foam, but um, I believe there's a 2019 uh, green um, building, um, green code cycle or Cal Green Code. So I'm, I don't have the dates for the form in front of me, but yeah, we'll have to see what their process is. So basically, the, cal, uh, the soonest would be, um, you know, the cal, uh, to incorporate form into cal, cal Green Code 2019 cycle. So whatever that. That's assuming if we go with the Title 24. So Paul Delaney, Southern California Edison again. Uh, comment on the energy efficiency discussion just a few minutes ago. Um, one of the problems, problems for us anyhow, in the new, new systems is identifying where the energy savings is coming from. Is it coming from the refrigerant itself or from the variable speed drives and the controls and everything else that's going on? So that's one of the things that we have to figure out along the way. Um, to that end, uh, what I'm being told by our regulators, um, they're trying to figure out a way to allow us to claim some value for GHG. So based on Justin's help a few minutes ago on asking for help from you to work with, or at least maybe I can talk to you about how to work with the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission to figure out how to figure out what that value might be, because then we could at least work towards incentives that would help. Um, the, other, the other comment, I guess, is regarding water consumption and energy efficiency from water-cooled equipment versus air-cooled versus, because that comes into play looking at the new refrigerants too, when you're talking CO2 and ammonia and, and other things, and then whether it's water-cooled, air-cooled, adiabatic, or whatever, that becomes part of the, part of the consideration. Um. Another question on the, the 2021 date for 750 for 410A for residential, light commercial. Um, 
it's going to it's going to force us to do a redesign in 2021, which is redesign the whole product line, requalify it, which is a huge task to us. Then followed in 2023, we have to do it again for efficiency. You know, one of the reasons we we like on the chillers we push for 2024 is to try and harmonize some of these requirements. But I mean, the sheer magnitude of what the industry goes through through a redesign is gigantic. You know, with multiple tiers, with qualifying, testing two of every product, um, you're, you're going to put us into a tailspin, you know, for the next 20 years, probably. Well, um, based on what we know, um, I think most of the, the refrigerants, the alternate refrigerants we're talking about are, e like Glenn said, equal or more energy efficient. Um, so that should not. No, but you still have to requalify, retest. Like, for example, just R32, different oil, different compressor, different coil circuiting, requalify burst pressures. There's a whole magnitude of just sheer agony of work, of just bureaucratic testing work that, you know, we're required to by federal law. So, you know, we'll end up doing all this stuff twice. So, we, you know, we should spend some time talking about how you harmonize some of these things. Okay, yeah, we'll let us know. Um, I have a question from Webcast um, from Keely Whitman. Uh, have you given any consideration to adopting regulations that require commercial refrigeration systems with greater than 125% annual leak rates to submit plans to reduce those leak rates? What about mandatory actions to reduce those leak rates? So Keely, um, uh, I think you're um, uh, basically asking what US EPA sort of did in their 608, which they require a reporting element for folks that have greater than 125% annual leak rate. Um, so currently with the state program, we actually already require facilities to rep report all um, refrigerant usage, basically any you know, system that leaks. So we already track systems that are leaking uh, at that level. And in fact, we are doing site visits and um, as we speak. So I guess the short answer is in terms of reporting and tracking, we already require that. And um, they're supposed to uh, fix those leaks. So there's already a requirement that if, you, if your system is leaking, you should be repairing it within a certain time frame. So it's already a part of state regulation. But in terms of chronic leakers, is something we're looking at where systems are leaking, you know, chronically every year, or you know, so that's part of our RMP refrigerant management amendment process that we would be looking at. So, hello, I'm Kristen Tedonio with the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development here on behalf of uh, IGSD and NRDC Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, we just wanted to applaud Airb for taking this on. Um, I think that your presentation made it absolutely clear that this is something you need to take on in order to meet your emissions targets and objectives. Um, organizations do strongly urge you to consider uh, adopting into California state regulations um, the rules 21 and 20 uh, in their entirety rather than in part. Um, and I think you've heard a lot of comments uh, regard to that today. Uh, we think doing so will provide a really good start in meeting your short-lived climate pollutant 2030 emissions reduction targets with early success that can be built upon uh, to assure that the state does meet those targets. Um, and, and we also do believe that you're absolutely right to acknowledge that you may have significant co-benefits. I mean, for instance, in Senate Bill 605 in California, you know, they prioritized um, actions that would reduce, reduce other air pollutants associated with power plant emissions that may impact public health and disadvantaged communities. So any co-benefits in energy efficiency that you could obtain would certainly help meet those objectives as well. Uh, and, you know, several people have noted that California's leadership can really help to provide some of that much needed regulatory certainty in the market right now. A lot of companies have invested heavily in alternatives. Uh, your rulemaking in this regard will reward innovation. Um, I think it's also interesting to note that some of your proposed actions may actually have the result of reducing regulatory burden on certain businesses. Uh, for example, your refrigerant management program uh, currently exempts uh, from a lot of your reporting and requirements uh, systems that use certain low GWP refrigerants. And so doing this early will perhaps, you know, in smaller businesses that may have a couple of these 
integration systems help to reduce that overall regulatory burden in the future. Um, you know, and while some may want to move a little slower, I, I think it's also noting that some wanted to move faster. Uh, and in conclusion, you know, we really urge ARB to move forward with your mitigation plans. Uh, very to meet these important emissions targets. Thank you. Christine. So folks can, you know, any more questions? On, I know we, I said rule making one, but rule making two is open for discussion also. <laughs> is there anything else we wanted to? And again, rule making two, which is the um, new system prohibitions, those are some things, again, it's a longer timeline. Well, not as long as normal. We're trying to still speed it up. So, but we welcome your um, participation. Um, individual meetings are encouraged. You know, if you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, let us know. Um, many of you you have already, but uh, additional folks are welcome as well. Um, the webcast, if you have any more questions. Any other questions in the room? Sure, good. To remember one with the HRI. Um, I think I would like to, to stress again the importance for the industry to, to harmonize effective dates. Uh, we criticized uh, EPA in the past because EPA was issuing regulation on refrigerants that were not in sync with the DOE regulations on energy efficiency, in particular for commercial refrigeration. And I think uh, after that, I think they, they started to talk and, and more of the dates were aligned. And I think we would like to do the same here. Uh, there are federal standards on, on equipment and air conditioning, for example, that uh, are due in 2023, putting uh, a limit of uh, 750 for uh, GWP for air conditioners by 2021 uh, will be totally out of sync with the DOE we're making. And, and as Dick mentioned, it's going to cost industry too much to redesign twice. So, so it's very important for us that those dates be harmonized to the extent uh, possible. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things I want to bring up is that this is a totally, you know, I've been through all the four refrigerant changes, so I've been around too long. Um, this one, we're going to flammable refrigerants. As you mentioned, we'll likely have to go to A2Ls. That's a whole new ball game, you know. The standards are still being developed. We appreciate all the money you've given. But I happen to be on the committees that are writing the standards, and you know we meet twice a week now, you know for the rest of our lives. But you know there's a lot of things we're learning. We did some of the testing that AHRI did. Things didn't go the way we thought they would, so we changed some things. 2021 is probably the best we'll ever do to get building codes done. Now you guys can get them through in California very quickly. Other states, like I live in Tennessee, they don't adopt things very quickly. That's why we don't have any taxes, but uh, which is a good sign. Uh, but you know, it can take upwards of eight years to adopt some of these building codes. So you could end up with a unique set of products for California that the rest of the country is not buying. Those will be very, very expensive products. Um, so you know, don't underestimate these building codes, the flammability. You know, the thing we want to do is make sure these products are safe. We don't want buildings catching fire. We don't want, and we have to train all these service technicians because we've already seen incidents where guys were servicing a product and they didn't realize it was a hydrocarbon and some very severe things happened. So, you know, we just need to work through that stuff. Yeah, we, we definitely recognize that and that's why it was on our challenges slide. <laughs> so we are aware of those challenges and we would like to work with you to see what the best solution here is. Again, it's a balance between, yeah, um, expedite, you know, meet our targets and do what the rest of the world will be doing anyways. And then, of course, safety is important. And these building codes, I mean, you know, as I've learned, they have very rigid schedules. Like to make the 2021 building codes, we've got to have everything done by January 8th of next year. Right, right. And, you know, some of the standards aren't even going to be published. So like ASHRAE 15.2, which is in development, which is a good standard for residential, won't make that cut. You know, we're trying to find some backdoor ways to get it done, and I know you guys are helping, but uh, it, it's going to be a challenge.
Just to speak quickly to the point about um, you know the, the cost of these products, if, if there was a situation where um, you know Cal California had, had regulations that were different to the rest of the country, you know I, I totally agree that there's a challenge in bringing codes into line. Um, but what, what we've also seen um, in other places is that when the regulations are there, um, the market will, will drive towards that and often have things in place before the regulations even come into effect. Um, and so with you know, the, the uptake in Europe, I mean, one of the slides you, you showed, Glenn, I think the number was 9,000 um, supermarkets in Europe using CO2. Um, that number is actually now about 12, more than 12,000. So you know, the rate of adoption is really increasing and, and, and prices are coming down in Europe. And then we're looking at California, which is, I think, is it the sixth largest economy in the world right now? So it's not an insignificant you know, part of the market that we're dealing with. So I do think that the market will very quickly catch up and the costs will come down accordingly. No, I understand that, on, especially on custom-built products like refrigeration. And you know, we make a lot of refrigeration in Europe. But when you get the high volume products that are built on assembly lines with mass production tooling, you know, the average design time is three years. 2021 is three years away. So we're already late in getting started. And, and you know, and if we have to do unique for California, it will not be on mass production tooling. So it will be a lot more expensive for a high volume product, appliances. Let me ask a follow up question to that then. When you say mass production, what, what is the largest systems you would make under mass production and not built up? Are we talking air conditioning, refrigeration? If you could you know, talk to both, that'd be great. Well, you know, it can vary. You know, let, let's take the full product. Like, let's take rooftops, which I'm quite familiar with. You know, probably up through 25 tons, their high volume assembly line, tack times, all that sort of stuff. But then you start getting into the components. If you notice, we tend to use the same compressors. So all those compressors are all mass produced massive amounts of production to get or tooling to get those things built. So, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, a large chiller may be station built, but the compressors, the fans, the coils all come from mass production type assemblies. So thank you. Okay, we have a couple more questions from the the web. Uh, under this is from Russ Barnthouse. Under the proposed sales ban, would warehousing for distribution to other states of refrigerants that are under a sales ban be prohibited? Uh, that's a good question, so we'll keep that under advisement. And then from Ted Atwood, he asked, will California be publishing a greenhouse gas inventory? And, and we do publish one, it's, it's on the web. We've, we've published one for a number of years, Ted. Yes, this is a comment from Webcast. Um, Given, give grant, grant incentives to refrigerators using thermal cooling plates with radiators and fans that could be solar powered. I think they should definitely um, work with the utility. They may have already existing energy efficiency programs. Any other questions in the room? A good one. Not a question, but a comment. Tom Morris from Honeywell. Uh, Honeywell supports the SNAP program from the EPA and also supports CARB trying to implement it in California. With regard to another thing you've mentioned, though, the incentive program, we think that could be a very powerful tool to deal not just with the new equipment, but the large base of installed equipment. So we would encourage you to do everything you can to work with industry to get more incentives to get rid of some of the high GWP products. And within that, one of the incentives really is allowing reclaim. Because if you allow reclaim, it adds value to the product you're taking out and can help offset some of the expenses in doing a retrofit. So that may actually be an overall net benefit to the program. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I guess one of the questions, maybe I can put it back on you, is um, we keep hearing the reclamation is important, and we agree with that. One of the challenge comes uh, that we would face is the um, tracking of it, or how do we enforce that? Somebody said, like, 
I think somebody brought that up is how would you know if it's not virgin versus, I mean, there's labeling or what's already happening with reclaimed refrigerant would be useful to know. Uh, I'm really not an expert in that area, but I think if you decide that you want Reclaim to be a meaningful part of the program, I'm sure there are many in the industry that, that could work together with you to try to find a good solution to that problem. Yes, this is Stephen Andraki again. Uh, we are a reclaimer, and uh, reclaimers are required to keep uh, very detailed records of the product that they received reclaimed, and it would be a very easy thing for a reclaimer to be able to track, and we could definitely work with CARB to uh, to come up with ways to ensure that Reclaimed product really is reclaimed product, um, and that uh, and, and that the go the goals of CARB are are achieved through the use of reclaimed as opposed to um, people coming in and, and um, basically trying to get around the process. Right, I think I agree. With, reclaimers are probably already doing that. It's the question is more of the, on the end users or the service, the thousands of service technicians out there. I mean, how do you track where are they getting the refrigerant from? Well, reclaimers t uh, typically sell into a wholesale market, and so the uh, wholesalers get their uh, sell the gas to the contractors. So it's really a question of what's on the shelves and how it gets to the shelf. Yeah. Okay, uh, an emailed question from Peter Mul Mullenhard. The proposed 2024 sales ban of refrigerants with GWPs greater than 1,500 would have significant hardships to businesses and homeowners that use R410A air conditioning equipment. Given that building codes are unlikely to be in place before 2020 that would allow mildly flammable replacements for R410A, that would mean that equipment that was only a few years old would need to be replaced since refrigerant would be unavailable for servicing after the sales ban. I encourage CARB to consider this when developing the second set of regulations. We will definitely be working with the stakeholders to try to resolve issues like this. Um, you know, a, a thought I had, but uh, we'll have to work with the uh, manufacturers, is I'd be surprised if there wasn't a near drop-in replacement to R410A. That's either being developed right now or, or soon will be. Um, if that does not happen, well, we'll uh, work this out together. You know, we've got uh, a couple years to perfect these regulations and make them work for everybody. So we'll we'll definitely discuss this further. This is a comment from Keely Whitman uh, Nasrek. She, um, she says, recognizing that ASHRAE is moving too slowly to update their standards with regards to natural refrigerant use. IIAR, and I think it's the, I won't say the acronym right, but I think it's the International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration, is starting to look into being able to fill that gap. I encourage anyone interested in moving faster than ASHRAE to contact the NASREC, which is the North American Sustainability Refrigeration Council, to get involved in their joint effort with IIAR. This is more of a comment, I think, from Keely. Eric, do you have anything on? You're aware of this? or Okay. Okay. We have this room till two. Right. <laughs> in case you want to stick around. I don't. I don't plan on talking that long, though. Um, we're on the front lines in the retail business of grocery stores, and we can tell you that there is a dearth of qualified refrigerant refrigeration technicians out there, even to work on conventional equipment, especially in Northern California. Uh, what is CARB California? Um, doing to encourage young people to get into this business because I can tell you that the old people like me are getting out of the business and retiring and there's the very few techs that want to work the long hours on grocery stores and weekends and nights. And when we start enforcing natural refrigerants, uh, there's very few folks out there that know how to work on these systems. And to get out into the rural parts of California to have somebody working on a CO2 system there may be one person that can work on that system. So what is CARB's plan, State of California's plans, maybe working with the State Department of Education, uh, vocational schools, whatever. I mean, this is a long-term problem that's kind of come up. Yeah, and we are aware we, that has been brought to our attention. Um, 
I don't remember, uh, maybe I'm, I'll say it incorrect, but I thought there was some funding was uh, is available to vocational schools um, to, to encourage this kind of profession. But we did partner with some of the um, local junior colleges and with their refrigeration air conditioning program to do some sort of training for actually, for even for um, our own staff um, program enforcement. So they are, do have courses out there. That's uh, something uh, we have partnered in the past, and we'll look into uh, what more we can do from CARB point of view. But I know there's um, trade groups like RSCS and um, ACCA that um, I'm hoping we're hoping to see what more can be done at that level. I think RSCS is already has a training program. A lot of the manufacturers have training programs. Um, I don't see some of the low GWP Hill Phoenix folks here, but so there is some of that, but we do recognize that, and um, will you know give us more input on what can, what f shape and form that can be uh, for the service technicians. We're recruiting at ARB if anybody wants to join ARB <laughs> to work on this program. <laughs> I had a quick Kevin again with AHAM. I had a question. I thought I, on the sales restrictions, but on the last question a little bit ago, I wasn't unsure. But the sales restriction on the no production import of refrigerants greater than a certain GWP, that doesn't include products containing, does it? That's just a sale of refrigerants. Or, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. About the right, yeah, we are talking about the bulk refrigerant, yes. I don't know if there's any service technician folks in the, uh, or maybe Kristen. Yeah, I'm not a service technician, no, but I, I can certainly speak to. Uh, I mean, any of the trade groups, yeah. Yeah, speak to that. I, I think, um, yeah, it's a real concern in terms of the aging um, service technician group and um, folks getting into this, this field. and. What we found in the industry, um, and specifically looking at this from the NASRC perspective, is that I think with the natural technology, it's actually attracting a younger group in large part because Paul's question before around differentiating between the added technologies and the actual refrigerant itself, um, they oftentimes come as a pair or have to come as a pair. Um, and because natural refrigerants are really pushing the technology in a direction that's more interesting, I think, to the market, um, that evolution is attracting younger folks, although we still have to get that message out. So that's really where the gap exists right now. And some of what the what the NASRC is working on with the service industry, as well as some of the trade groups out there um, that represent um, service groups, uh, as well as the educators in the market, uh, is to really promote that so that folks see the writing on the wall and understand that, you know, they're not necessarily going to be turning a wrench, but could be operating the system from their cell phone. And I think that's the exciting part about where the industry is going. This is Dick Lord again with Carrier, but you confused me a little bit. So you're banning the refrigerants in bulk, but let's say I have a unit that I charge with the refrigerant and, you know, we don't produce in, in California. That still can't be brought into the state, right? Um, that's correct because of the new equipment. Okay. The, the new equipment uh, ban and new refrigerants that would apply to pre-charged equipment. All right, so it's the bulk for service and then the yeah. new equipment. You get exactly a bulk for two ways. Right. Gotcha. I think uh, the fact that the SNAP, I mean, uh, it used to be if the, depending on the court case, I mean, the SNAP provisions that were more federal would have prohibited those refrigerants and new and retrofits anyways. Okay, go ahead. Blame it on you if we get late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you got to use up all the time. Come on. You know, I came all the way here, so I'm going to keep you here. Sure, sure. <laughs> on your model, and I've been impressed by the details in your model. Um, are you going to make that actual model available that we can look at it? Well, yeah. Short answer is yes. I mean, we've been working on this off and on for about 10 years or more. And, uh, you know, the analysis is available. Uh, the write-up on what the Kigali Amendment would do. And 
in terms of the actual model, like, you know, we can share spreadsheets, anything. It's unlike the US EPA vintaging model, ours is transparent. Uh, I mean, I, I, we, will, we will share every input and every assumption that goes into it. And so the, the short answer is yes. I, I, I know you, you worked with Helen on it, and I've worked with her a lot on the models. And, you know, we've tried to put in, and you know, I was impressed by your model, you factored in volume growth, which a lot of the models didn't have. Uh, you know, I'm interested in your leak rates, because we're trying to do things on leak rates, and reclaim, and all that stuff plays in. So I, th I think we're there just to kind of collaborate with you, really. Right, seeing no uh, <laughs> hands raised here or on the webcast, so, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Helen, Helen will turn or hey, Dick, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I was going to try not to speak today because I never seem to be able to do that, but um, I just can't resist. Um, I, I guess um, I, you know, I, I think you guys have worked very hard on the modeling and trying to find a solution that will meet um, the, the legislative goals. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you certainly have shown the gap. Um, I think I think that I would um, encourage you to um, maybe take another look at how uh, the adoption of the SNAP rules might be considered. Um, in that, um, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the auto provision that you're talking about using, um, but I'm a little concerned that maybe there's um, an awful lot of credits out there, and maybe um, maybe this may not be interesting. Perhaps the auto folks could speak to that as to whether or not this is interesting to them or if there's something else that would be more interesting to them um, in this regard. Um, I'm a little bit worried that it'll, if it's not interesting for those folks, that it may shift the burden more uh, to, the, um, to the stationary front um, where there's already a significant challenge to overcome. The, the other thing that I would say is that um, I think that uh, certain sectors of the market have had a, some challenges or concerns around uh, not not the inevitability of this happening, but uh, maybe some things around the dates, you know, um, coordinating with uh, DOE rules or, you know, what have you, uh, whether it's, you know, domestic appliance or, or maybe chillers or what, whatever it may be, um, time for transitions and so on. It may be good to have maybe some sector-specific um, discussions with folks, um, with a broad group of stakeholders uh, just to help, you know, uh, to kind of get their input uh, on a sector-specific basis, um, in any way that you, <clears throat> excuse me, in any way that you might um, be considering uh, modifying from what the SNAP rules say today. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Um, obviously, uh, the rules we presented today were pretty broad. Um, I'd be surprised a year from now if it weren't just a little bit more segmented. So uh, we'll work with all the stakeholders and, and figure out what's feasible. Helen, did you, what did you mean by the MVAC? Uh, I just wanted to clarify. I, I'm just not familiar with the rule. I know that when we had had some discussions about the medium and heavy duty, um, there was some concern that um, the incentives might not be interesting to folks because um, uh, maybe they have enough credits already and so they just don't, they, it's just not interesting. So I, I'm just not familiar enough with the rule to, to speak to it, but that's, I know, a concern um, that we've seen in other ways that people have tried to incentivize transition. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, when I modeled the um, future HFC emissions, I did take into account that the, the um, even if the, I guess, the SNAP goes away, the clean cars credit would be so attractive that just about all the manufacturers would want to start using HFOs. So that's a good point. Um, if that doesn't happen, then the burden does fall more on the stationary side. So we'll, we'll look into that closely. Uh, my name is Harshal Inamdar. I'm from Reem Manufacturing. I had a question about the, uh, the, the emissions model uh, that, that you presented at slide nine. Uh, where there's a separate entry for, so there's 26% emission reductions come from the Kigali phase down, 
and then 24% emission reductions come from the US EPA SNAP rulings. But as far as I understand, the Kigali phase down lays down limits on production consumption of HFCs for certain countries, right? And then how a country would actually achieve that phase down is by implementing bans on production or use of that refrigerant. So I, I don't understand why there's two separate entries. There's one that's only attributed to the Kigali phase down and then there's 24% emission reductions that are attributed to the US EPA SNAP rulings. Okay, I, I think um, what we're getting to is the incredibly complex interaction of these different uh, reductions. Essentially, if you, if you look at Kigali, US EPA SNAP, and CARB proposals, there are slightly overlapping reductions. If there was only one, only the Kigali phase down occurred, CARB didn't do anything, SNAP went away. The reductions would be more than 26% of our goal. It'd be closer to about 40 to 45%. If there was no such thing as uh, Kigali or CARB, the US EPA SNAP uh, reductions would grow slightly. And alternately, if CARB were the only reductions, those would be larger. So what you have here is you have overlapping reductions. The bar chart does not double count reductions. So the impact of Kigali in a realistic sense would be reach us about a quarter of our reductions. If that's the only thing that happened, it would get us 40 to 45%. Um, I realize that's a little confusing, but all of these things interact with each other. So yes, the, the phase down by itself would do okay, but essentially what happens with SNAP, it makes part of the phase down unnecessary. And what California is doing is we don't want to wait for the phase down to work in 2040 or 2050. We want the HSE phase down sooner. Um, first of all, it's a state law and it's part of our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, I hope that answers it. Um, if you read the methodology, it's, sorry, it's 36,000 words. Um, it's available on our website. I think it explains that. And, and Glenn, isn't it kind of based on the order that you applied? So the order of operation is first in that chart you gave credit to Kigali, then SNAP, and then ARB's regulations. Right, exactly. Um, the way this was, uh, the emissions were modeled and potential reductions, it's, a, it's all sequential. So there's already some SNAP requirements. 2019, you have your first Kigali phase down. 2021, I modeled some ARB reductions, but now we've got more SNAP requirements. 2024, we've got more phase down. Let's see what's going here. And uh, then you have uh, the retrofits and sales restrictions. So if you model it sequentially, you get this uh, very interesting interaction. Any burning questions? Any other questions? And again, this is not the end of it. Um, so for the rulemaking, the draft reg that's out there, I just want to reiterate, we have, we do want, appreciate your comments by November 10th. Um, so if you can, because that's on the expedited uh, time frame, we plan to take that item to board in March, which means if you back calculate, there's a timeline that we have to go through our own um, process here. So. November 10th is a deadline for the draft reg language that's out there for the SNAP provisions, so please give us your feedback. Um, we did change some links on uh, kind of last minute. Uh, so we actually do have a link to the public comment page, ARB public comment page, so you can actually post your comments directly on that. So the, uh, you should see that link on our um, in the presentation and also on our HFC measures page or SLCP, wherever you get to this. Uh, and feel free to call us. Um, or send it to us if you have any uh, any questions. And like I said, if you want to have any one-on-one -on -one meetings, we are open for that, to that, so reach out to us. Uh, again, thank you uh, for being here, and thank you to everybody on the webcast. Okay, I see one, Helen has one other question. Go ahead. I'm actually getting questions on text now from people on the phone. <laughs> the okay. Phone clarification. They wanted to better understand the foam, um, concept of the foam that, that you all are talking about. 
So um, essentially, this so the SNAP does did include the prohibitions on foam insulation sector. So that's something we are working with um, Title 24, the Cal, um, the Green Building Code, to see if they can incorporate that in their 2019 code cycle. And so, it, if when would the code be adopted, and when would the and it would be a requirement or voluntary? Well, I have our uh, Cal <laughs> <laughs> Green Building Court expert. She can answer. Hi, Dana, Dana Papke Waters, uh, California Air Resources Board. Um, I've been leading our efforts with the Green Building Standards Code. Um, we actually are pulling together a proposal that would go to the Building Standards Commission. I understand they're going to be holding some of their initial workshops at the beginning of the year in January. Um, it's something that if um, adopted by them um, or um, proposed by them as well, um, would be adopted in the summer um, of 2018 and it would go into effect January 1st, 2020. Um, at this point, I believe we're proposing mandatory, mandatory yeah. provisions. Maybe I can add to that. I just happen to be the vice chair of ASHRAE 90.1 and typically with insulation, we just specify U values. So you would have to add something else like it's got, can't contain these materials or use these refrigerants. So, you know, it had to be a new clause in standards, which is not impossible, but it would have to be new. Just a clarification. Uh, is, is it for also for equipment, appliances, uh, or is it just for Good question. At this point, we're just looking at buildings. Buildings, okay. Well. And the copy of the draft reg language, there's some copies in the back um, if you want hard copies, um, but of course they are posted on our website also. All right. Well, thank you again and look forward to talking to you more.